may want to do further cross matches on that unit that has potentially caused a reaction. Uh, when we look at um, an acute immunologic transfusion reaction, uh, one of the common, not, sorry, not common, hopefully not common because we're going to be doing cross matches, uh, is an immune mediated hemolytic reaction. And that's the reaction of the, of the donor to um, the, recipient's, sorry, the recipient's circulating antibodies to their own red blood cells. The severity of this kind of depends on a number on the number of red blood cells that are, are destroyed and obviously kind of somewhat depends on the, the circulating antibodies. Some of the clinical signs that we see are fever, so we're monitoring their temperature closely, uh, restlessness, uh, salivation, vomiting, if you see that, uh, important to stop the transfusion. Uh, and then ultimately it gets worse from that point on. If you start seeing incontinence, they can go into shock and obviously die. Uh, other things that we may see that you probably wouldn't see right away uh, is hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, DIC, and acute renal failure. As mentioned earlier, the most important thing is to stop the transfusion. Uh, they, uh, you may be involved in administering uh, crystalloid therapy and uh, oxygen therapy to help stabilize the patient and provide supportive care. An acute immunologic transfusion reaction, um, and another one is a febrile non hemolytic reaction. So again, temperature is one of the important things that we're monitoring. Uh, so if we see an increase of greater than about a degree uh, Celsius without any other cause, uh, then it's usually a reaction to transfuse, transfuse leukocytes. So this is again where a leukocyte reduction filter may be helpful. Uh, some of the other signs that you may see in a conjunction with the elevated temperature is chills and fevers. In general, we start off by lowering the transfusion uh, rate as long as the temperature hasn't spiked too quickly uh, or sometimes depending on what the temperature is doing and how the clinician wants to uh, deal with the patient is to stop it and then potentially start it at a, at a slower rate. Some will administer non steroidal anti-inflammatories or, or steroids. An allergic reaction uh, is caused by uh, a substance in the donor's plasma, and, and one of the common things is protein. And essentially, this uh, causes an activation and release of histamine. So uh, you may see, as you probably exposed to other allergic reactions, is um, hives or urticaria. Uh, and then obviously to the other spectrum is severe uh, anaphylaxis, uh, signs of shock, and potentially death. So again, stop the transfusion uh, if you observe anything. If you're starting to see any little hives developing, any little bumps, uh, antihistamines may be administered, uh, obviously supportive care. Sometimes, depending again up to the clinician, if there's just some mild signs of hives, they may want to administer antihistamines and then restart the transfusion. Of course, if there's any other sign other than this, it's certainly recommended not to continue on with that, that particular donor. Trali is another um, type of reaction that uh, is still not totally understood. Uh, it's called transfusion-related acute lung injury, and it usually occurs during or within uh, six hours after the transfusion, transfusion, and it's in patients with no previous history of lung injury. And the mechanism is not totally understood. I mean, it, there's kind of discussion about uh, the, the endothelium of the lung linings being disrupted and, and whatnot, but it's you know, there's kind of debate as to what exactly the, the cause of this is. The other concern about this is that it's very similar, the presentation to acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, so you'll see the respiratory distress um, the respiratory signs. Uh, they can also have an elevated temperature, elevated heart rate, tachycardia, and also be hypoxemic. And so part of the differentiation between TRALI and ARDS is taking into consideration the uh, clinical disease of the animal and the timing of when this develops. So again, it's really important for us as monitoring is to be able to take note of, you know, he was breathing fine, perfectly fine before we started the transfusion, and then as we're getting into the transfusion or shortly thereafter, he started developing respiratory signs. Uh, because it can be otherwise hard to differentiate between whether this is TRALI or ARDS uh, on radiograph or by looking at some of the things to rule out. Uh, so that's where, again, our keen observation skills are really important. Diagnosis of TRALI is made by excluding all of those other things. So one of the other, uh, some of the other things to rule out is overload, uh, fluid overload, uh, bacterial contamination, as, because one of uh, the things that we've mentioned is uh, they can have an elevated temperature. 
The treatment is mainly supportive. Uh, oxygen is, is uh, one of the key components, may administer IV fluids. And depending on how bad the respiratory uh, process is, the animal may need to be ventilated. But generally, it's a self-limiting process, um, which is different from ARDS, because ARDS has a whole, you know, whole other spectrum to it, and usually animals that go into ARDS are quite sick. Uh, but for trolley, as long as it's recognized and provided supportive care effectively, uh, it's usually self-limiting. Uh, acute non-immunologic transfusion reactions, uh, transfusion-associated sepsis, and this is again where we are also extremely important uh, in preventing this. Um, if you're collecting blood products to donate to an animal, ensuring that you're using straight strict aseptic technique. Uh, same thing with um, when you're administering the product, make sure that you're using strict sepsis when you're connecting the animal to the blood transfusion. Uh, if this is suspected, then obviously the transfusion is stopped. The veterinarian may or may not want to do some further testing on the blood that you're administering to the animal, whether it be a gram stain or cultures. Um, and again, just uh, strict asepsis when you're handling blood products because it's the perfect media for bacterial growth. Uh, circulatory overloads, uh, it's a colloid which tends to uh, draw fluid into the vasculature and so it's, it can be possible to overload the patient. Uh, clinical signs, obviously uh, respiratory signs, dyspnea, you, the animal may be cyanotic, uh, have an increased central venous pressure if you're monitoring that or if you're observing the jugular veins and pulmonary edema is a consequence of uh, fluid overload. And this is where, again, component therapy is more important. Uh, for an animal that's anemic with, for example, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, giving them a whole blood transfusion, you're giving them lots of other products that they don't necessarily need. You know, it's the red cells that they want. So, and when you're not able to do component therapy, they may be more prone to having circulatory overload. Uh, Treatments uh, stop the transfusion. They may or may not be administered diuretics, and certainly oxygen is important. Uh, no, uh, example of a non-immune mediated hemolysis is um, is has to do again with us. Uh, we can actually damage the red cells on how we how we are handling them. Uh, so when we see people handling the red cell unit and they're massaging it or kind of you know squeezing it, not a good idea. That can uh, you know, damage the red cells. Uh, proper temperature during shipping or collecting or storage is very important. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, extreme temperatures can damage the red cells. Important to use the, the biggest catheter or needles you can to administer the blood products because uh, small bore catheters or needles can actually damage the red cells as well. And as we did also mention earlier, we can also see osmotic hemolysis if we administer uh, incorrectly uh, in medications or fluids that are um, uh, hypotonic fluids as well too. You can cause lysis of the red blood cells and therefore uh, damaging them. Just some uh, complications of massive transfusion reactions. Uh, citrate toxicity, which I personally have never seen, uh, when you have increased citrate levels because of multiple transfusions, uh, citrate is uh, one of the anticoagulants used in storing blood products. Uh, it binds to the calcium and the animal can actually become hypocalcemic as a result. So to monitor for signs of tetany or whatnot, the tremors, uh, if you are giving an animal massive transfusions. Hypothermia as a result of giving large volumes of blood, again, that are not warm to uh, room temperature and can actually result in cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, hyperkalemia and hypokalemia, probably more hyperkalemia just to the uh, damage of the red blood cells. They leak uh, potassium and from what I understand isn't quite as uh, clinically significant in our animal patients as they are, you know, as they see it more in human patients. We sometimes see coagulopathies as well too if you're giving large numbers of, of blood products um, either because of dilution uh, or loss of platelets and clotting factors. Uh, air embolism. Uh, thankfully, I've never seen that either, but certainly a risk when you're administering uh, blood products if you're not monitoring them closely, if there's air introduced into the line. Uh, signs to monitor for are cough, uh, dyspnea, and potentially shock. Delayed transfusion reactions. Uh, those are uh, um, immune-mediated hemolysis that's... Um, 
is not acute, so it's usually seen uh, three to five days after the transfusion. And essentially, the, you'll see the animal's red cell percentage come up or pack cell volume, and then it will start to decline over kind of the next few days after transfusion. And this is usually caused by production of red cell antibodies that are already circulating pre-transfusion, but not at a level high enough to identify in a cross-match. And that's it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>